a pretty savage criticism of endogenous growth theory. So um, I'm going to start off with the first page of my new book. So here is the first page of my new book. It's entitled The Puzzle. So the, you open the book. It's not come out yet, but I'm writing it. And the very first words you read are The Puzzle. And it starts like this. We apparently do not understand economic growth. Here are some statements from a succession of distinguished economists and economic historians. David Landers of Harvard wrote in 1969 that it is impossible in the present state of our knowledge to evaluate the parameters of economic development. Angus Madison of the OECD wrote in 1982 that technical progress is the most essential characteristic of modern growth and the one that is most difficult to quantify or explain. Nathan Rosenberg of Stanford wrote also in 1982 that economists have long treated technological phenomena as events transpiring inside a black box. Douglas North, the Nobel laureate, wrote in 1993 that missing is an analytical understanding of the way economies evolve through time. Eric Jones, whom some of us here know, wrote in 2000 that technological change is something that is very hard to solve within the usual parameters of economics. Robert Allen, Oxford economic historian, wrote in 2009 that explaining the Industrial Revolution has been a long-standing problem in social science. In 2010, Deirdre McCloskey, well known, subtitled one of her books, Economics Cannot Explain the Modern World. Gregory Clark, economic historian, at the University of California, Davis, wrote in 2014 that the Industrial Revolution has defied simple economic explanations or modelling. And Joel Mokia, perhaps the most famous current economic historian, wrote in 2016 of the, of the Industrial Revolution that scholars know remarkably little about the kind of institutions that foster and stimulate technological progress and more widely intellectual innovation. And this trail of uncertainty culminated on the 12th of April 2018 in an article in The Economist entitled Economists Understand Little About the Causes of Growth and subtitled the first in a series of columns on the economics profession's shortcomings, the Economist's free exchange columnist wrote that though the economics of growth should be central to the discipline, economists had little to offer but assumptions about how unmeasurable things affect other unmeasurable things, which provide only a measure of our ignorance. Consequently, the Economist's columnists concluded economists should speak with greater humility about how this structural reform or that tax change might affect long-term growth. They have not earned the right to confidence. So uh, everyone is saying that, that they don't understand economic growth and these are the economists themselves. How does this happen? Because the reality is everybody understands economic growth apart from the economists. If you go to the sociologists of science or the historians, everyone understands how it happens. But unfortunately, the only people who matter are what are called the endogenous growth theorists. These are the economists, people like Paul Romer or people like Philip Aguillon. They're the ones to whom government refers when they ask how, how economies should grow. And they're the ones who say that we don't know and who put forward all the theories that are completely incomprehensible. This is a most interesting puzzle. This is actually not so much a talk about economics as a talk of intellectual detective work. How does the most important thing in economics, which is growth, end up being a complete mystery to the economists themselves, but not to anyone else? So we have to start with a story, and it is a story. And the story starts really in the United States of America, because everything economics starts in the United States of America which between 1776 and 1950, or perhaps we should say 1957, believed in laissez-faire. America, like Britain before it, did not believe that governments should fund science. This is a huge contradistinction to the continental model, where the French and the Germans famously huge investment by governments in science. Yet curiously, the Industrial Revolution was British, no government funding of science. And then for the set next hundred years with the American century, 20th century, again, laissez-faire. So everyone knows 
that economic growth ultimately comes from innovation, from new technology. We're richer than we were 100 years ago, not because the price of land has come down, but because we have ele electricity and stuff like that. It all comes out of R&D, it all comes out of technology. And yet the two lead countries over a 200-year period, basically the most important 200 years of economic growth in human history, were in the hands of countries where the government did not fund science. And yet the conventional view, endogenous growth theory view, is that governments have to fund science, which is why, of course, we now live in a world where governments do fund science everywhere, including even in Britain and America. The interesting thing is that the British did it in the absence of government funding of science, and the country that overtook us was the States, whereas if you look at France and Germany, huge government investment in science, they never even converged on Britain, let alone overtook. Latterly, of course, Germany overtook Britain, but that was long after the period we're talking about, which is basically the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, apart from the very end of that. So the historical record suggests that governments don't have to fund science. So what happened? Well, what happened was this. America did not believe in the government funding of science until Sputnik. Sputnik, for those of us old enough to remember, and I'm not one of them, but my parents used to talk about it, Sputnik was the most terrible shock to the American psyche. It looked as if the Russians were going to nuke us from space. And America was convulsed with something that can really only be described as a moral panic. What are we going to do about the fact that we've been overtaken by the Russians? So what the Americans did is they looked at what happened in Russia and they saw that everything in Russia was funded by the government. Sputnik was not a free market enterprise. Sputnik was very much the Soviet Union. And so the Americans said in 1957 and 1958, we are going to copy the Russians. And they created something called NASA. They created something called DARPA. And they created the Higher Education Act. Literally billions upon billions of money suddenly going into R&D Whereas up to that point, the Americans had never funded R&D, except during war, of course, in wartime. But for example, the OSRD, the famous OSRD that was created in 1940, that created the Manhattan Project and all those other marvellous things, was disbanded in 1947. The Americans did not believe in the government funding of science, apart from in war. But the moment there's peace, they get rid of all that. But in 1957, they thought they were going to be overtaken by the Russians. So they copy Russian policy. And that creates a crisis in America. Does this mean that communism is more efficient than the market? Does it mean that governments have to fund science because the most important thing is economic growth and that depends on the government? This presents the Americans with an intellectual crisis to match the earlier moral crisis. Something is wrong with capitalism. And so the American government turned to the RAND Corporation, which stands for R&D, the RAND Corporation, for intellectual help. And the RAND Corporation said, we can help you. We will employ two young, brilliant economists, Richard Nelson, who became the doyen of the economics of science, and Ken Arrow, who won a Nobel Prize. And we will produce for you a theory that says that free markets are perfect in everything except for science. That's the one exception. And so we will provide you the intellectual justification for what you want to do in Washington, D.C. And that's exactly what Richard Nelson and Ken Arrow did. And what did they do? They were charged by RAND to produce academically credible papers that said free markets are better at everything except in science. Go off and do it. And here's your fee. Well, the first thing that Ken Arrow and Richard Nelson did, and by the way, their papers are published under the RAND banner, there's no pretense here, is they looked at the facts. And to their horror, they found there was absolutely no historical or empirical reason to believe that governments should fund science. And actually, there was no reason to believe, in fact, if you look at it, that just because the Russians had put Sputnik into space, that the Russian economy would overtake the American economy. As many of you will realize, it actually didn't do. I mean, if you talk about a waste of money, it's that. But that was no good after Sputnik. They had to come up with a justification for following those policies. So because the empirical facts weren't there, Nelson and Arrow did a very clever thing. 
they came up with a theory. Now, those of you who are not economists, and I am not an economist, may not know this, but there are two sorts of markets in the world of economics. There is the classically competitive market that we could call the real market, the market all of us here know. And in a classically competitive market, companies compete with each other to do research and development to get the next monopoly product by which they make money. The big successful companies do so by doing R&D, coming up with an innovation, making lots of money from it, and then doing the next innovation. That's how the market works. But there's this other thing called the perfectly competitive market, which was invented towards the end of the 19th century by a group of marginalist economics, economists, the details of which aren't important here. Let me just tell you what the perfectly competitive market does. In a perfectly competitive market, there's an infinite number of producers, an infinite number of consumers, an infinite number of products which are interchangeable, and perfect knowledge. No one knows anything that everybody else doesn't always know. Now, this is a very useful exercise for certain theoretical uh, activities. So a man called Pareto showed, for example, that in such a market, there's an optimal distribution of resources. But the thing about the perfect market, it gives you an optimal distribution of resources, but there is no research and development. Because by definition, if you have research and development, it's no longer a perfect market because someone has proprietary knowledge. And so what Nelson and Arrow did, and it's really breathtaking in its, in its chutzpah, they said, the perfect market is the perfectly competitive market. We should all aspire to live in a perfectly competitive market because then there will be an optimal distribution of resources and we'll all be happy. But unfortunately, we'll never get a perfectly competitive market if companies do research and development. Therefore, they should not do research and development. Instead, the government should do all the R&D and distribute it to all the other companies. That's what we should be aspiring to do. So one, Nelson and Arrow said, we should live in a world where nobody does research apart from the government, so that way we get a more perfectly competitive market. But they then came up with another argument, belt and braces. In any case, they said, private companies will underinvest in research and development because if I come up with an innovation, you can all copy me and steal my innovation from me. I spend $100 million on coming up with a new innovation. You can all copy me for free. That's what they said. You can all copy me freely. And you can therefore beat me to the marketplace because I've lost $100 million in my research and development. And you can copy whatever I've done for free. And therefore, you will push me into bankruptcy. So the Nelson and our arguments say two things. No one can appropriate their own knowledge, and in any case, and therefore governments have to fund knowledge to compensate for that. And in any case, you shouldn't have private companies doing R&D. It should be a state function so that the market can be as perfectly competitive as possible. Now, I personally find these papers, and it was Martin Ricketts, bless him, who walked me through these papers. I personally find these papers absolutely outrageous. I mean, it is disgraceful. Arrow's paper has had 16,000 citations. It's cited more today than ever before. And it's always being cited. Look, the Nobel laureate Ken Arrow has shown, A, that, government, that uh, private, mar private markets will produce inadequate amount of research and therefore the government should fund it. But moreover, the government should fund it because we don't want market. And this paper is cited to this day more than ever before because it's been shown by a Nobel laureate. So, having produced these papers, the American government and the British government, and all Western governments, then started to pour money into research because they had the imprimatur. And then the interesting question is, what actually happened? Well, we can look at long-term rates of economic growth. Nothing is the answer. Long-term rates of economic growth have been growing asymptotically from about 
In the case of Britain, about 1690. In the case of America, since about 1830, slightly different long-term rates. But you suddenly get this huge increase of funding after Sputnik in these Western countries, and nothing happens. Economic rates of economic growth do not increase. By the mid-60s, you begin to see a recognition that this is all a waste of government money. And since 1964, to be precise, Western governments have been funding less and less R&D and less and less science. And what's happened is they cut all that funding to long-term rates of economic growth, precisely nothing. So why is this and why is it never talked about? Well, it all comes down, once you forget the nonsense about perfectly competitive markets, it all comes down to this other thing which is constantly reiterated. You read any review of the economics of science, and I've just looked at a couple, most recent, most distinguished economists, and they all say the same thing. If I do a piece of science, at best, I will get a certain return on my science, and you will get twice as much return on my science than I do. This is to this day repeated as complete dogma. And indeed, you can show it's true. You can show it's true that if you look at the marginal benefits of a piece of science, for those of you who aren't economists, let me put this in other ways, if you look at the immediate response and consequence of a piece of science, I do a piece of science and I get a certain profit, and from that particular piece of science, you will all get twice as much profit as me, you, that statement is true, the marginal benefits of that piece of science, you will get more than I do, and therefore governments should fund science to compensate for my underinvestment because I'd be disincentivized by this terrible situation. But it's not true. You do not get my science for free. I, as it happens, know how to clone a gene. I suspect I... Oh, no, no, there are two or three people in the room who can also clone genes. But most of you people do not know how to clone genes. If I clone a gene and I write a piece of paper telling you how to clone a gene, how many of you in this room could now just go off this afternoon to the claw lab and clone a gene? Not very many. Before you're in a position to copy me and clone my gene, you have to invest years of your life in learning. And actually, you only get to the point that you can copy my gene cloning protocol by the genes you yourself have cloned, because knowledge is tacit. There is no such thing as purely explicit knowledge. All knowledge is tacit. In fact, even among scientists, there's a very interesting thing, study, but you could have hundreds of such studies of a particular laser called the TEA laser. The details aren't important. It's just one of the iconic studies, but only because it was one of the first studies sociologists looked at. But you could look at hundreds of other studies. And the TEA laser came out from a, a Canadian lab in the mid-80s, and all the other laser labs in the world wanted to copy it. Of course, it was a great advance. Not one of them could copy it from the published data. The TEA people tried to make it easy for people to copy, but in the end, the only people who could copy, even fellow possessors of the same tacit knowledge, had to go to the Canadian lab or to someone else who'd learnt from them and learn in their, with their own hands how to do it. We can know more than we can tell. And... Um, all the way back to Boyle of Boyle's Law, who created the Royal Society. Boyle had exactly the same problem with his gas pump. He could not show anyone by writing how to reproduce his air pump. Sorry, air pump. Everyone had to come to London and learn from him in person. He was absolutely startled by this, which is why the Royal Society, in part, was created. Knowledge is tacit. And if you look at the total costs of copying, so the marginal cost of copying, if you are all brilliant experts in molecular biology, you can in that do quite well from copying me. You might actually do more money on that very narrow piece of science that I do. But the price you've paid to copy me is not just the marginal cost of that particular, it's also all the papers you've published or the patents you've published or the products you produce that I can copy that I, in my turn, can copy from you. Science is not a public good. It's a contribution good. The benefits of science are open only to those who've already made their contributions to it. And once you add the average or the total cost together, 
copying costs as much, on average or in total, as it is to innovate. It's simply not true that it's a public good that is freely available for free because it just ain't so. So, I'm about to come to the end of the talk. I mean, the, you know, I've spent the last 30 years of my life studying this, so there's an awful lot more I could say, but my th philosophy of talks is just produce the kernel and then you have the discussion. So the real justification, the really interesting question is why? Why has the economics profession bought in to a theory and a story that is manifestly untrue? Because don't think the data is not out there showing it's not true. In my book, I've pointed out that the sociologists of science, the philosophers of science, the historians of science, damn it, even the patent lawyers, they all recognise knowledge as tacit. They all know that endogenous growth theory is not true. Here is Agion and Howitt, Endogenous Growth Theory. There are three other standard textbooks of economic growth in the libraries, and they're all as big as this, three other sets of authors. So there's a pile of books that high. And they all purport to tell you how economies grow. Four books. This has got 700 pages in it. The other three also have 700 pages. It's a pile like that. The word tacit does not appear in a single one of these four books. Knowledge is tacit. Economic growth is explained by the fact that knowledge is tacit. And not a single endogenous growth theorist has mentioned even once that knowledge is tacit. They have all modelled knowledge as explicit. And if you model knowledge as explicit, then you don't understand economic growth. Because knowledge is in fact tacit, and it's only if you understand that that it makes sense. And suddenly, all sorts of things make sense. So the pattern of economic growth is like a right angle. For thousands upon thousands of years, since the last ice age, economic growth has been nugatory. I mean, so small, it, you barely notice it. And then suddenly, bang, the graph just goes, I mean, it's, it's, it is literally a right angle. Why is that? Well, it's because knowledge being tacit, no individual scientist can produce enough research to make an important discovery. It's too complicated. You need the science of other people. And it's only when enough scientists have come together and are sharing their knowledge together that suddenly you hit that critical mass. But it can be done only by the sharing of knowledge because knowledge being tacit, you have to literally get together. If endogenous growth theory were true, the endogenous growth theories would predict that scientists would be as secretive as possible. Scientists would hide away from each other and try to keep their secrets secret. But in fact, if you look at what scientists do, not just in academia, but in industry, they all come together and share knowledge. One of the great unknowns, it's out there, the facts are well known for those who want to search for it, is industry is a consortium. Competitors share knowledge quite openly. I mean, it seems to break. Oh, there's someone nodding there. Yes. I mean, competitors share knowledge. And, and openly, uh, IBM shares knowledge with Toyota and all the rest of it. And it's understood because if you look at the maths, imagine there are 10 of us all sharing knowledge. Imagine each of us produces one piece of knowledge, 10 of us, each of us producing one piece of knowledge. And then number 11 comes along and puts three bits of those knowledge together. If you've got 10 people all contributing one piece of knowledge each into a pool, someone else can take three of those bits of knowledge and you produce over a thousand different possible combinations of knowledge just by that. So if 10 people share knowledge, each of them, by combining three of those bits of knowledge, can produce more than a thousand different options. So we all benefit. If I am the only person doing research, I have access to one piece of science. If 10 of us share knowledge, even though they're my bitter enemies, we now have a thousand pieces of science and combination that we can all take. So we can all go off and do our own thing. And so if I'm a steel maker, I can make a different type of steel from a, a ship, from an a aircraft carrier, from a tank, whatever. And we all benefit from sharing knowledge. Of course there are times when you want knowledge to be proprietary. Of course there are. But knowledge comes proprietary. Contrary to myth, because it's tacit, it's very hard to find out what the next person is doing. And in fact, the history of science, both industrial as well as academic, 
is of people breaking down the barriers of tacit knowledge, trying to share knowledge more actively so that we could all benefit from the increases of knowledge. So if the endogenous growth theorists were right, we would be secretive the way European science was before, say, 1500. What people forget is that European science was once secretive. People like Galileo published in code. They literally published as an anagram. And Galileo published the moons of Jupiter as an anagram. And the reason he did it is he wanted to put it out there that he'd made this discovery, but he didn't want anyone else to benefit from his discovery. And so he just waited until the next person came along and made the same discovery. And then he interpreted the anagram and said, look, I got there first. This was standard practice. It was standard practice to write a paper, then give it to a lawyer and only release it uh, after a competitive publication had come along. Secrecy was the norm in science and in industry before the scientific and industrial revolutions. And what the scientific and industrial revolutions were, which basically are synonymous, by the way, is people learning that actually they do better off in their own private interest to share knowledge because the tacticity of knowledge means that if you get together with fellow competitors, especially competitors, because they're the only ones who know what you want to know, you each benefit. Although there's a danger that the next chap, next person, might benefit from you, if there are enough of you around, then suddenly you all produce so much more options that you can exploit than you could individually. And that's why you suddenly get takeoff. You hit a critical mass and then suddenly everyone is better off. And that's why economic growth has its shape. So I've gone on for longer than I meant to. Endogenous growth theory is based on a complete and utter fiction. And if you look at endogenous growth theory to this day, so here is a popular book of indulgence growth theory, Aiken's Power of Creative Destruction. And in here he expels that. The model is that you assume that the market is perfectly competitive, except for one little sector where people produce patents. And you then exploit the propriety knowledge of patents to make your profit. That's the model of indulgence growth theories. It's all about trying to keep knowledge secret. There is no historical evidence for that. It's the exact opposite. It's when scientists started to share knowledge with their competitors that everyone took off. Which is why Martin Ricketts and I describe science as a contribution good, not a public good. Mm -hmm.